Today on Between the Lines, Dr. Gerald Schroeder, a physicist who believes we've been wrong about God all along. Welcome, I'm Barry Kibrick. Professor Schroeder began his physics research at MIT and for decades has worked to change the debate between religion and science. Now with his book, God According to God, he offers a radical shift on how to understand the physics of the Big Bang and the spiritual aspects of creation. Between the Lines with Barry Kibrick is made possible in part by the government of Puerto Rico's tourism company. Encouraging viewers to take a break and relax with a good book. Every page brings a new and exciting experience. Puerto Rico, we book romance. But I'm a writer today because I was a reader when I was 11 years old. And it was... You do, need, uh, need, you do not need to prove your state of happiness to anybody. Most of these speeches were as much as a month in preparation. The characters, the heroes in this book are seekers of truth in, in a story that, that involved a lot of corruption. You don't get a chance to really talk about what's real. Oh. And that is the first thing you do. Gerald, welcome back to the show. It's been a while, but a pleasure to have you here again. It is my pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me again. Uh, you know, I took a look at this book, and at first, the title, God According to God, I, I told my family, I said, boy, Gerald, how bold can you be, am I right? <laughs> yeah, you've got it. Yeah, it is, it is a bit of chutzpah dick, but, uh, <laughs> but, but I didn't say God according to Gerald. I said God according to God. <laughs> exactly. Well, the book is, what makes this unique is it is literally a physics primer. You get to understand the basic major present-day concepts of physics, and you get to understand the basic original, almost Hebraic version of the Old Testament. That's the goal of the book. There are chapters that hint the science of it, and there's a hap hap chapters that hit exactly the, uh, the Hebrew text as brought in English. Your whole goal is to make sense of the two, to somehow tie them together because in the, in the Old Testament and in the modern f physics, there are similarities and, and concepts s that hold up to this present time. And your job is to show the world how tightly knit these two concepts are. I think every discovery that's coming out of modern science today is bringing this, the physical picture of the world closer to the biblical picture of the world. People sometimes see conflict, but in fact, it's integration that's happening, especially with quantum physics. I mean, the change in understanding the world is just overwhelming. And yet we see this whole idea of this interplay between the physical and the spiritual. That's what the whole, that's what the Bible's about, obviously. And science, is, science has gotten to that point. The metaphysical has entered the classroom. Well, you know, you even say it should be taught now in the classroom. It's funny, I had uh, both people that you wrote about, uh, Leonard Mladenov and uh, Stephen Hawking, and I had Leonard Susskind, another great physicist up from Stanford. I think that's where you're heading later today. And I remember when I had uh, Leonard Susskind here, and I asked him, I said, can you as a physicist say that something transcends the universe? And I remember distinctly he said, you know, in physics, we don't like to do that. But it sure seems that way to me. There's so his, yeah. that he said it right yeah. here. So there is this, this sense on both sides that it's coming together. When you get to the philosophical writings of these giants in physics today, or the last hundred years, we'll say, when, when the quantum physics and, and relativity all broke onto the scene, and you get away from the equations, and you read the writings, the philosophical writings, they all are saying that, that the world is more of an idea, a thought, a mind, than a, than, a, than a physical machine. Well, you say, I'm going to use your words, the physical and metaphysical make up a single reality. That's what's been missing. And it's funny why it's missing, too, because if you look in the Old Testament, you even look in the New Testament, you even look at the Quran. All of it is based on a singularity, a unity, a oneness. And of course, even Einstein, his whole purpose was to find that unified field theory, yeah. which is that search for that ultimate spiritual quest of creation. 
the course of creation of a unity that pervades all of the creation. You know, there's a, a, the famous central statement for biblical religion, Hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Which, by the way, Jesus, when quoted by Mark and Matthew, when uh, the apostles asked what's the most important sentence ever made, and guess what he says? Hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. It's Deuteronomy, chapter, the fifth book of the Bible, chapter six, verse four. Now the simple reading of that is, is one God. But that's what we say in Hebrew, kita aleph, first grade. The deeper meaning is that there's a oneness that pervades all of existence, a spiritual oneness that we're discovering in physics is mapped by, is mirrored by the material oneness. I mean, you think about it, it's embarrassing, but sometimes you get goose pimples. It's so, it's so intimately locked, the two are together. There's the spiritual and the physical come together and they meet, they meet in humanity. They meet in our mind, in our brain because we can conceive of and study the physical universe of a oneness. The spiritual then almost wells up out of the physical discoveries we're making. But that's, and one of your little pet peeves in fact is that we, we've been reading even the Bible wrong. We've been looking at it too simplistically. We haven't, and the translations, my gosh, they've been so literally taken out of context that what we're learning today in almost all of the religions is not really what was there from the beginning. And what was there from the beginning is what really seems to be mirroring more the physical realities of the state of physics that we know today. Uh, what you're saying is, it sounds like it's right from my words. Absolutely. Oh, wait, wait, Gerald, it is right from your <laughs> words. I read the book, that's where I'm getting it from. <laughs> no, no it's, it's, it's so extraordinary. There is this reality that is coming from the science classroom that has transcended the material. The myth of materialism is gone. Now, when I told you I had on Leonard Mladenov in his book, The yeah. Grand Design, and I read your article also about it, the one thing was these quantum fluctuations. And, and this in, is a sense what precedes even the Big Bang, which therefore precedes time, which therefore obviously precedes whatever. That's what's kind of interesting. And when I questioned him, because everyone was taking the Hawking Mladenov book and saying that does not mean that God did this, he was very careful and he says, but if you read me carefully, it doesn't mean that he didn't. What physics now is based in, to the best of my understanding, is probability. And in fact, you can never prove that something is right. You could only prove it's wrong, or else it could have any probable amount of ways that it occurred. Could occur. The, I think the, the nuance of this idea of using this Ed Schreiren in, in about 25 years ago pre presented the idea that the universe might be the, the result of a quantum fluctuation. Now that statement is, is, has tremendous theological implications because if a quantum fluctuation created the universe, that means quantum fluctuation is part of quantum physics, which is part of physics, which is part of the laws of nature. So it means the laws of nature predate the universe. Now the laws of nature aren't nature. The laws of nature are concepts. So we here have something that's non-physical that predates the universe, which means it predates our understanding of time, which means it's outside of time or timeless. So Barry, this is this description. Something not physical predating outside of time is able to produce the physical, namely the universe. Well, that sounds like God to me. Not physical, outside of time, etern timeless, eternal, and is able to produce the physical world. The only difference here, and there's only one, one difference, which is significant, but it's only one difference, is that non-physical, timeless, non-thing, because that's the description of God, it's not a thing, it's just a, you know, a force that can produce the universe, is it also interested in the creation that it made? That's the basic question, because that's, that's the only way in which science is different from G-O-D, God. Well, you hinted at this before, and, and this again, he, he, you know, when I, when I did talk with, uh, with Mladenov, he said, you know, when you're done reading this thing, you can still have awe, and, mm -hmm. and I think you do no matter what, and because these words that you say, life appeared with purpose already a part of its birthright. So that is that, concept you talked about before that if 
a fluctuation, a quantum fluctuation. If that movement, if something pre-existed it, it must have had the blueprint somewhere already in it because everything from that Big Bang, from that moment after the, because we have to make this clear, the quantum fluctuation is the moment prior to the Big Bang. It oh. is what causes the Big Bang. It's whatever that little movement, and then what made the bang so big was the rapidness of how we went from quote unquote nothing to something and how big that something was. Yeah, I think I mentioned somewhere, I've read it, the difference between nothing and something is infinite. Now, but we don't like in physics to deal you're, with infinite. No, you're right. I've tried, <laughs> I've had so many physicists on this show and every time I bring that up, they make sure that we can't deal with that really. It, it's just like we can't deal with that transcendent, even with a wink, when they'll know that there is something that should be dealt with. Can't, and, and yet for some reason, it isn't it funny, in my, and, and we talk about this, we're gonna to get to it real deeply in a minute, the, the soul spirit that exists out there. But from my own soul spirit, from my own essence that I can remember, I've always had an easier time dealing with the infinite than I did with having to deal with the beginning. I find the beginning a harder thing to grasp than the always existing. Look, if it's always existing, you ha there's no problem with the beginning. The beginning is tremendously complicated. That's the whole, all these the tremendous discussions about, about even if it is a quantum fluctuation, what, what are the first forms? Is the energy c con concentrated in, in, in what type of form? Is it electromagnetic radiation? Is it strain? I mean, there's a whole range of, of uncertainties, put it, that, put it that way. But there was a beginning. That's phenomenal. Well, this is, in fact, speaking of uncertainties, this is what you say that life developed from the simple to the complex is a certainty. What drove the development, that's the central debate. That's where we keep, it's going back to that why. Why did we, in both theologically and in the world of physics, we know that to be true. It's what drives that debate mm -hmm. though that we're still wrestling with. This is, it, is sound, it sounds bizarre, but the oldest translation that we have of the Bible is called the Jerusalem Translation, about 1900 years ago, from Hebrew to Aramaic. Aramaic is a sister language of Hebrew. And the translation of Breshit, the opening, the Hebrew word for the, in the beginning, that's usually tr the first word of the Bible, is not in the beginning. It's, the, the word Breshit is ba Reshit, it's a compound word, with something, b, with something, called reshit, a first cause, reshit is a first cause, and that first cause is wisdom. I think this gets right to it. The oldest translation that we have says that with the first cause of wisdom, God created the heavens and the earth. That comes from proverb number eight. Not that God was wise, that's not what it's saying. God used a substrate called wisdom, Hebrew chachma, wisdom, like a potter uses clay to make the vessel, God used wisdom to form the world, and that's what's present in everything. Like you say, the, the, or I say, <laughs> the purpose is present right from the in the beginning. Everything has this wisdom embedded into it. I'm gonna now go back to where I think the physics and the spiritual really reside, and this is something that I've been holding dear for a long time, and, I, and I've never seen it expressed but by you. And this is what I want to focus on right now, and it's this. Our consciousness resides within an entity separate from the physical brain. That concept is one that I think truly brings physics and spirituality together. You give the greatest example, I heard it on radio years ago, when you talked about, in fact, a receiver, a radio receiver. And you said, if you plug it in, you hear the music, but if you break that radio and that receiver can't pick it up, where'd the music go? It still is there. Call it in the void, call it in the space, it still is there. This concept literally implies that our essence, call it soul, call it who we really are, does not reside within us. It resides in the 
ethereal, in the void, not in air, because that's already a particle thing. But we, our brain in particular, at least to the best of our knowledge, is the receiver of ourselves. And this physical, what's that classic line you use? Or, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read it. We are not, well, it, it, it's a term I know that's used before. We are not physical beings having a spiritual experience. We are spiritual beings having a physical experience. That concept I need to explore deeper with you, that we are not really here. I don't know. I, I, go for it, Doc. <laughs> We're, we are here because our bodies are in the picture. I can't say it better than Erin Schrodinger. It's almost my name, Erin Schrodinger. He got the, he was one of the earlier person to get the Nobel Prize in, for quantum physics. And he says, I'll uh, uh, paraphrase him, but it's almost a direct quote, that we don't belong, in the, we're not in the picture. The reason that we think we are in the picture is that our bodies are in the picture. And that is the only way of us communicating with them. The we that we are is something it's a, I'm just it's just it is not if you took two ice cubes and put them together one wouldn't say how cold you are about the other because it's part of the physical system that they're in so we see ourselves in the in this in this in this world but we never by the time we're old enough to start questioning things like consciousness we don't even think about it any longer Marshall McEwen said it perfect in medium is the massage I'm not sure who discovered water but I'm pretty sure it wasn't the fish because if we, from the time we're born, we are ourselves and we are, we are part of this. So we just assume that with, the, that the, with, the, with this physical entity. We are. God forbid, don't stand in front of a truck. It'll run you down, you know, because we're part of the picture. That's right. But I th what it deals with is really along the lines of life after death. I mean, that's what it comes down to be, that when, then when the radio is smashed, the radio waves are still out there. Did you happen to see HBO had an Emmy award-winning film on a, on a great woman named Temple Grandin? No, I didn't. It was amazing. She was uh, uh, autistic, but yet one of those uh, complete brilliant minds. And she's uh, her own PhD uh, in animal science and the treatment of animal. And there was a classic scene in the film where the farmers were uh, putting the electric bolt to the cow and killing it instantly. And the minute it died, she asked, where'd he go? Where'd that cow go? And the guy goes, what do you mean? It's right here, dead. He goes, no, 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 no. That's just the meat and the bones. Where'd the cow go? Uh -huh. That's what we're talking yeah. about here, yeah. right? It's the yeah. same thing. Where does it go? And we know from even older physics that nothing can be, once it's created, it cannot be destroyed. All it can do is change its yeah. form. So. This goes back to that eternal life. In a sense, we all experience it, and yet, at the same time, don't stand in front of a train or a yeah, bus. Yeah. It's a very, that's a hard concept for us to grab onto. But the, the data are very strong. I mean, in physics, we find more and more the idea that there's something metaphysical. Once it's metaphysical, it means out of the physical. So then that makes mind not, that makes mind in, con, in accord with the physics. If we find the metaphysical forces acting in here like, a, like a, a, a quantum fluctuation that produces from nothing into something. So we do have this, this interplay between the physical and the non-physical. So, well, when we get to talk about mind and brain, it becomes very uncomfortable because immediately it makes us, you know, it's too close to home. It's one thing a quantum fluctuation produces the universe. Okay, we'll debate that. But to debate whether the mind produces the brain, can't, you shouldn't do that, that kind of stuff. You know, in other words, that's... Almost taboo, huh? Yeah, that's almost taboo, yeah. You know, Gerald, we're, we're, we're talking about such interesting things. You, I know that you'll respond to people if I give out your website we oh, talk I about. Oh, answer, I answer emails. P yeah, perfect. Yeah. I'm going to give it out then because I know this is only going to cause people to c come and find out more mm -hmm. about this www. very simple your name Gerald Schroeder.com. We'll leave that up there. The Big Bang, this is what you say, did not bring any matter, just energy fields. That again, physics believes it in the biblically, but it's physics that states that now. To separate that material from the spiritual is purely myopic. That's what we've been talking about. Yet, the system, as advanced as it could be, there's a quote in here that says, 
we are more mind than machine. And you give examples of the void. And I use the word void because when we talk about space, people somehow think space is air. Space is this thing around us, and, and it's not. And in fact, when, when you give this example, I think it's, it, it'll blow people's mind about even the ethereal aspects of a solid table. When you look at the nucleus, and then you look at the nearest electron or proton, the space between, obviously a, a wonderful discussion of this show, yeah. the space between is literally, did you say millions of billions? Yes, yeah, one part in a billion. One part in a billion. So from the smallest atom, the space between. Uh, uh, one part in a million billion. Really. One part in a million <laughs> billion. The space is still so much grander. And it's not air. That, uh, it's not air, air just I space. Yeah. Void. What, that's, the, that's a hard thing, too, because we think of this, as I said, as space, but it's not. We're talking about a nothingness. I mean, literally, yeah. correct? At least to the best of our, we can't measure it. Now, I guess we call it a, a nuclear force. Is well, that, that what we say key. that's in there? That's the key. The, the question is, how does the, what holds the electrons in orbit, this cloud of electrons, around, the, around this, the, the nucleus, the center of the atom? Because from here to here, if I scale it up, let's put the, let's say the center of an atom, it's called the nucleus, is this big, or I make my hand, not like an orange or a grapefruit. If you had to make a guess, where would the electrons be? They'd be four miles away in both directions. Can you imagine having to find an orange in a basket of something that's eight miles in diameter? I mean, that's the scale of what there is. And between here and the four miles away, we're not talking about air, nothing, exactly what you're saying. So the forces, somehow these emergent forces, and that's what the mind and the brain is. What's emergent from what? Uh, but it's emergent for certain, for certain that, uh, the, just put, that, the, that there are forces that, that emerge from a proton and from an electron that keep them in orbit. But where are they? Well, they're called virtual photons. A photon is a force-carrying particle. Virtual means it doesn't exist, but it must exist. Because if it didn't exist, none of this would work. In other words, that's what virtual means. It has to be there, but we can never see it, but we can see its results. It's kind of like God. You know, we can't see God. We can see God, God's, God's results. I mean, the classic, just about the mind and the brain. I, I, I'm talking with you. You're talking with me. You're hearing me. I'm hearing you. There's no sound in your brain. Zero. Well, you say the, the, what I call the cop-out answers. Well, the chemistry of our brain interprets it as sound. That's nice to say, but there's no sound in your brain. You have chemistry in the brain. And the identical chemistry that occurs here, which produces sound, occurs back here. The identical chemistry produces vision. There's no light in your brain. I mean, you may be a light to the literary world, but there's no light inside your brain. But we're seeing light. It's, is that the mind? Is that? Is it just chemistry? Uh, the debate will go on and on. I mean, I, it's been going on since Descartes about the duality between the mind and the brain. But I, my feeling is absolutely the further science digs into the reality, just about this, the emptiness of the world, that the, that the mind becomes the more dominant than the, than the physical brain. And it's the mind that, that lasts. And that's not just Schroeder speaking. You can give a list of whole Nobel laureates that say the same thing. And I come for, from the theological point, then wrapped onto the science. Like Nobel laureate, the late George Wald. Mind is the essence of existence. And that's a man who started out his life as an avid skeptic. A skeptic in writing, not just after two drinks and a cocktail party. A skeptic <laughs> that you don't need God. God is unnecessary, and he changed. And it's just so exquisite that it transcends the concept of what the physical can really explain. And, and mind is the essence of existence, as strange as it sounds. Well, Gerald, we, as you said, we'll be talking about this for eons to come. But our time is up, and I, and I want to end with, with these words. It's not a question of consciousness arising from matter, just what you're talking about. It is rather quite the opposite of matter arising from consciousness. Thank you, Gerald, for raising our consciousness. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. My I pleasure. It. My I pleasure, it. Professor. And thank you guys for joining us. Now, before the professor leaves, I would like to leave you with these words from God according to God. 
Light beams become alive, not only alive, but self-aware and acquired the ability to wonder. The wonder is not whether this genesis took six days or 14 billion years or even eternity. The wonder is that it happened. Of that fact, there is no debate in science. There was only one physical creation. Science refers to it as the Big Bang. The Bible calls it creation. I'm Barry Kibrick. Somewhere, somewhere between science and the Bible lies the wonder of life and the awe of creation. Thank you so much, Professor. If you'd like to get in touch with us, want a DVD or transcript of our show, catch an episode online, or receive our weekly updates, go to www.klcs.org slash btl. 